Buying real estate overseas is a great way to diversify your portfolio, increase your returns, earn more cash flow, or just to have a property to use for yourself. It's a great diversification measure that can oftentimes lead to a second residence or passport, offer asset protection, and just help you build your wealth. But one thing that I hear from folks a lot is I don't know how to invest overseas. I know how investing works in my own country, but I'm afraid of what I don't know if I go to a new country. I'm going to give you a few key things that I think people should think about and my thoughts on those concerns in this video. Hey guys, I'm Andrew Henderson here at Nomad Capitalist and on nomadcapitalist.com we talk a lot about legal tax reduction, things like second passports, but also how to invest your money overseas because I believe that you are going to see in the 21st century a lot of opportunities in markets that you've heard of, big countries in places like Asia, but also in small markets that you haven't heard of. What I always am talking about is that in my lifetime of three and a half decades, you have seen countries that came from relative obscurity to being real powerhouses or being in the process of becoming powerhouses or at least becoming substantially wealthier uh, than they were before. If you just go back a couple decades ago and look at the South Koreas, the Singapores, places like that, you would see tremendous growth and you probably wish you had invested a couple decades ago back when things were much, much cheaper and they weren't as expensive as they are now. And that's what we talk about here in the channel. Lots of videos that go through that. But let me share some concerns that I hear from folks. These are the concerns I think that you should think about. If you have a particular concern, if you have a question, if you have um, a complaint, leave a comment below and I want to hear what you think about this. We're going to go through each comment and we may make uh, more videos on this topic. Uh, but the first thing that's really important is defining the unknown unknowns. So what you might have uh, in other markets is some good unknown unknowns, such as in Southeast Asia, a lot of landlords will write the lease to where they don't fix your washing machine, the tenant fixes it. Okay? Or in a lot of Eastern European markets, or just a lot of markets in general, you know, if you slip and fall on something, if you poke your eye, uh, then there's not really a lot of liability the way there would be particularly uh, in the United States or in some Middle Eastern countries. The tenants pay the rent for a year in advance and you have to worry about chasing down the rent. Okay, Those are good unknown unknowns that you would be positively surprised to hear about potentially if you're not from those markets. But you might also have the unknowns of, hey, in this market, even if you have a one-year lease, the tenant can give you a 30-day notice and they can bail out at any time. And so you really don't have that kind of security. Or, hey, over here, they don't allow Airbnb. Or, uh, especially if you're from the United States, you might not be familiar with the concept of stamp duties or you know, transfer taxes that add to uh, the cost. And so understanding those unknown unknowns is important. You know, one of the things that I've done over the years is I've developed great relationships with good attorneys. And sometimes it requires going out and hiring different attorneys to figure out who's good and who actually knows what they're talking about and who's not so good. And I've done that in a lot of countries where you have to waste some money uh, to find the good attorney. And a good attorney oftentimes has a great network, including of real estate agents. In some of the markets um, that we talk about, their market is often uh, littered with people who are not nearly as professional as you might expect. And that's another unknown unknown. If you're coming from a developed market, you might be used to websites like Zillow and you have comp data online and you have analyses and all kinds of stuff. You know, in most markets, this is point number two now, uh, you are not going to have the kind of data that you are. And so what do you need? You need people with local experience. That's where the attorney comes in. Um, I generally don't, don't you know, take the advice of real estate agents when it comes to doing deals. I have some real estate agents in my network who I totally trust and they have a great you know, feel for the market and where things are going, where a particular property could be going and that's invaluable. But on a broad basis, I like to have attorneys, I like to have other local business contacts who I can run a deal by and they'll tell me, you know, is it a good deal? You know, what's the area to be aware of? And so again, more unknown unknowns, right? Now, the easiest thing you can do is if you just want to buy in a city environment, I just buy in the most, you know, 
prime location in the downtown in the capital city of a country or the, the chief city, like in Turkey, in Istanbul rather than Ankara, for example, or, or in the US, I might buy in the, the best location I could in New York rather than Washington, DC. But you know, in most countries, I'm going to buy in the capital. Um, but you know, if you are looking for a place to live in, you want something a bit further out, or if you're trying to spend a little bit less money, or if you're trying to find something higher yield, then you want to know where are the areas that actually work. And if you just go on these websites, you know, Turkey and Bulgaria and uh, parts of Latin America, like Mexico, um, there's a couple other countries that come to mind where they have these beautiful, like really nice websites selling beautifully overpriced properties, you know, 20, 30, 40% more than what I would pay if I went to that market. You've got a few examples, like there's a website, City Expert in Serbia, like really nice, and the prices are actually relatively normal. But in most cases, these sexy, glimmering, you know, English language websites, they just don't uh, have the great prices. You've really got to go on an ugly website that's generally in a local language, or in some markets, properties aren't even on a website. And so again, another unknown, there may not be a multiple listing service. In some countries, it may, may literally be a for sale sign hanging on a window somewhere. And that's the entire marketing that someone might decide to do. And so uh, in addition to these kind of unknown unknowns, there's often a, a lower standard of professionalism. But you can use that if you know what you're doing to go out and find great deals. Because in many cases, the agents aren't as sophisticated. They're not going to be you know, negotiating as hard. Um, now that's not true in every market. Um, particularly in Asia, but if you go to some of these you know, up and coming markets, you can go and you can really get a deal because people are not that well represented. Basically, emerging markets with a lot of potential are more opaque, that's why they're emerging. And so if you're coming from one of the, the big developed countries, some Western European countries, certainly the US, Canada, Australia, UK, etc., you're going to notice a, a dramatic difference in how property is bought and sold. That's why I've said one of the best business ideas if you're a young person or if you've just exited a company and you're looking for your next thing, go to one of these countries and start the city expert of wherever. Uh, and I think you could really do a big job attracting a lot of both foreign investors and also eventually uh, higher level local investors who want to spend more money. You could start an agency or some kind of uh, aggregation service. Big, big job, but I think it could be very profitable in some places. Uh, the third thing that you want to be aware of is different legal systems. Now, I mentioned in a good way, you know, especially for folks from the US, you'll often see much less liability overseas. A number of the countries where uh, I spend time, most people's homes aren't even insured. Or you'll go and you'll say, hey, uh, I want to buy insurance. And they'll say, we only insure up to 30,000 euros or $30,000 because it's just they're not used to in insuring big structures. You can negotiate in many cases with them to pay extra, to have them review your case, and, and to get a bigger insurance policy. Now, obviously, in some of these places, the average house might only be $100,000 for a, a beautiful apartment in the middle of the center. Um, so it's not like you're insuring a million dollars with only 30000 in coverage. But um, that's you know, one thing that's different for most folks. Now, on the other hand, of the, the, the lower liability, um, what also is an issue is, you know, is it a common law country? Is it a civil law country? Is it, is it a, a Sharia law country? Um, is it pro-tenant? Is it pro-landlord? Uh, pro you know, one thing I've learned uh, growing up in the West, I had a, a family friend who he managed his family's, like, I think it was 800-unit apartment complex, and he would tell me stories. He'd be, one time he told me, he said, uh, next week I have to go to housing court. Uh, because a tenant uh, you know, did something and now they're suing us, right? It kind of flipped. And he said, Andrew, I'm like 16 years old. He said, you always lose in housing court if you're me, right? Because you're the landlord. You always lose in these Western countries in housing court. Now, I don't think it's always that unfair, but you have to understand which, you know, where you're going in. What are the laws? I like to look at the culture of a country. Are they business friendly? Are they investor friendly? Do they want people to bring their money, right? Um, and what is their legal system? Do the judges just make it up as they go along? You know, in some Latin American countries, uh, that is an issue. Um, I think certainly for someone who likes common law, uh, a commonwealth country might not be a bad uh, choice. 
certain places in Southeast Asia. What you also have to understand is, am I getting a freehold property, a leasehold property, some other kind of version of that? You know, do I own the land underneath my property? There are certain places in the Western world where you don't own your land underneath the property. So this isn't even a developed versus emerging question, but you want to understand that. You know, don't just go to a country and assume that I own the land and I'm going to own this property forever. It could be a 30-year lease, 99-year lease, 999-year lease. Okay, you want to know that? What are your liability? How do you protect yourself against tenants? You know, all these things are more unknown unknowns. I think that a lot of the countries that we talk about, you can use these to your favor, but you want to really be aware. Obviously, the fourth factor that has to come up is currency risk. Now, what's interesting in a lot of emerging countries that might surprise you is they often price their properties in uh, in euros or in dollars. So we talk a lot about Georgia, properties there are in dollars. Places like Serbia, even though they have the Serbian dinar, would be in euros. There are countries that you maybe didn't know they use the US dollar just as part of their everyday currency in Ecuador, for example, Panama, Cambodia. Those are basically dollarized economies. Uh, and then you've got other countries, though, Malaysia, for example, or Thailand, uh, where they have their own currency, and that's generally the price that property is sold in. And in fact, in some of these countries, if you see a price quoted in dollars or in euros, uh, you should run. Sometimes you'll see in a country like a Turkey, where the, the currency is so volatile, you'll see them quote in dollars, but then they have to switch it back to lira. And so especially if you're trying to do a residence or citizenship program, it can be kind of dicey and you have to really get it done just right uh, to make sure that you're investing the right amount in dollars, but then it translates to the right, <laughs> the right amount in lira. It becomes really a mess. But if you want to avoid currency risk, you know, go to one of the countries that I mentioned or others where they price things in a, a major international currency or go to a country in Europe for example, that, that has a major international currency, or go to a country um, that has a, a comparable, you know, smaller but, but, but stable currency, like the Singapore dollar, the Canadian dollar, et cetera. To me, those are kind of the worst options because those markets are very overheated in many cases. Um, but you know, if you're going to buy property uh, in some emerging markets, uh, in the Balkans, for example, I would look at Bosnia. I think properties are generally sold there in, in uh, marks. And, uh, you know, the mark in that case is pretty stable or the Armenian dram is pretty stable. But if you get into a property where it's in Turkish lira, you know, you want to be aware of that. Sometimes, like in places like Iran or Venezuela, where you have hyperinflation, people just don't sell their properties or property prices actually go up in some cases because um, their currency has plummeted so much. It's not like you just go and buy a house for $18. Um, but in other cases, like in Turkey, you've seen the price of, of property go down to where now I think it's, it's rather pretty affordable uh, as a long-term hold. Okay. So those are some things that you definitely want to keep in mind. If there's something that you think uh, I missed that you'd like to hear or discuss, please uh, leave a comment below. Uh, what are the things that I'm not worried about? Uh, at least in the countries where I'm going to, people worry about corruption. They worry about you know, military invasions, things like that. Uh, number one, if a military invades, you know, your property is still there generally. Now, if they destroy the whole place, I guess that's different. Um, I'm not one of these guys who think China is invading Singapore. You know, obviously people, I almost think at times, this is kind of a convenient excuse for I don't want to invest overseas. You know, it's, it's kind of like the... Um, I can't come like, you know, my sister's brother died. I can't come to your party, sorry. Just say you don't want to come to the party. If you don't want to invest overseas, that's okay. Um, corruption, obviously there is corruption in some countries. It's interesting because, you know, someone, I saw a comment thread a while back about uh, property in Turkey and people said, oh, you know, in Turkey they could take your property. And someone said, you think they have nothing better to do? You think Erdogan's sitting around? And that guy with that $100,000 apartment, I'm probably going to go and take that. Now, I mean, even to say all the properties of foreigners, we're going to take every foreigner's property. Number one, it's a massive undertaking. Number two, you know, I've looked at countries and I've spent a lot of time a number of years ago in Central America, for example, where they had some pretty crazy stuff going on not too long ago. Now, maybe they have some of those same beliefs, but they realize it's a very competitive marketplace today. Okay. You're not going to get ahead. I mean, look at the last bastions of communism. Look at Laos. Okay, Maybe there are a couple of countries that just don't care, the Bhutans of the world. But by and large, the Nicaraguas and the countries like that, they realize we need people to bring in cash. We need investment. And I see a lot of times they will actually treat you better or they'll have laws that will make it easier for foreigners. 
Um, you know, those are things um, that, that you'll run into. And so, listen, if a government makes it difficult to do a lot of different things, I, sometimes I look at visa policy, right? Malaysia and Georgia being two great examples, Ecuador, another good example, where it's very easy for pretty much anyone to go and visit. To me, that's not a definitive um, signal that investing there is a good idea, but it is a signal that the government is open and they're not trying to keep people out and that they're probably open to capital as well. So that's one of many indicators that I'll take a look at. This idea that these governments that are trying to uh, grow, that are trying to be competitive in, in a competitive marketplace of countries, that they're going to come and start screwing with foreigners' capital and taking their homes, I really don't think uh, is an issue. And I think what people do is they overlook that as, uh, as if a Western country wouldn't come and bail in money from their banks or shut down the banks, which they have, right? And so this idea that uh, it's going to happen in Nicaragua, well, it already happened in some places in Europe, right? Other Western countries like Australia have already put in provisions that you know, they can bail in part of your money from the banks, right? So it already exists in the developed world. Uh, and I actually think that real estate by and large is a relatively safe place to park money. Of course, there are exceptions to this, but by and large, I think that the trend is moving in the right direction. What I would be focused on is some of those first four criteria for figuring out where I want to invest. How can Nomad Capitalist help you? Four ways. Number one, subscribe to our channel and click the notification bell to make sure you get our new video every day. Number two, get a copy of Nomad Capitalist, the book. You'll learn a lot of my personal experiences over a dozen years of studying this stuff, as well as exactly some of the strategies that you can use to build your Nomad Capitalist plan. Number three, if you're not sure where to start, but you want to come and learn from my team and I, you want to come and mingle with like-minded people, learn more about our live conference, Nomad Capitalist Live. It's coming up soon. And number four, if you want some help right now because you've got a burning issue, you need something solved, you want to lower your taxes, get a second passport, or build the Nomad Capitalist lifestyle of your dreams, go to nomadcapitalist.com and click on Become a Client.